We start this afternoon at 4 o'clock with an officer accused of leaving a woman in a police car that was hit by a freight train. She was defending herself in court today, claiming she had no idea that they were at a train crossing. The woman was pulled over for a road rage incident. Officers put her in the back of a cruiser, which was parked on train tracks. Luckily, she survived that crash with the train. The officer who placed her in the police car is facing attempted reckless manslaughter and a misdemeanor charge, a felony. Investigative reporter Jeremy Hahola was in the courtroom. He's live in Greeley with what she had to stay, say. Jeremy. Hi there, Kim. Yeah, today was a very significant moment in court because we hear from the officer who was facing that felony you mentioned for what she did the night a woman in her custody was hit by a freight train. The officer here claims, this is her words here, claims she, quote, never perceived the train tracks that night. That's despite signs of train tracks and the tracks below her feet. Now we've seen the body camera footage. The footage shows officers doing a felony stop on a road rage suspect who had a gun in her truck. In that footage, you will see a police car parked on train tracks. This is crucial evidence in this case. Fort Lupton officer Jordan Steinke placed the woman in a police car parked on the train tracks before it was hit by a freight train. That woman, Yoreni Rios, survived. Officer Jordan Steinke says she did not perceive the train tracks during the police stop because she was focused on a potential threat from the suspect's car. Here are some of the officer's claims on the witness stand today. In hindsight, why do you think you did not notice the train tracks? There's a few reasons. It was incredibly dark. I was miles outside of my jurisdiction. I was fairly certain that that particular stop was gonna end in a gunfight. I never in a million years thought a train was gonna come plowing through my scene. In the meantime, the victim in this case, the woman who survived this train collision has not been in court, but her attorney has been here inside the courtroom behind me here watching the whole trial for the past two days. We spoke to him briefly about what she's been going through 10 months later. She's taken it one day at a time. Um, this, this incident has forever changed her life um, in, in a way that, you know, it, it's gonna leave an indelible mark on her life for the rest of her life emotionally, mentally, physically, um, and every day, you know, it, it goes through her mind. Yoreni Rios suffered with numerous broken bones, including a traumatic brain injury. As for this trial, Officer Jordan Steike is again facing a felony charge here. This trial will continue on Thursday morning at 9 o'clock, and we expect to be monitoring that. So we'll see what happens. Kim, back to you. Well, it's certainly her story that the jury needs to hear. And this arrest and, you know, Urena Rezus was in the back of a car in handcuffs at the time. But there are several officers involved. So a lot to weigh. But it seems like this trial is going along fairly quickly. Yeah, they've talked to a lot of witnesses and they've, uh, you know, they've heard from police tactical experts who say sometimes when officers are doing a felony stop, sometimes they are so focused on something that they miss something else right next to them. So we'll see uh, what the judge decides in this case in the next few days. Oh, that's right. It's a judge. Thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Jeremy. Well, there's some good places to be today, like, well, Elitch Gardens. That's a place you can cool off. You may notice in the bottom right of your TV screen, it says, I think that says 99. That's a lot of degrees. Well, uh, just add a zero at this <laughs> point. Just go one, zero, zero. Kathy's joining us now. The very hot stretch continues this week. Uh, how hot did we actually get today? So far, 99 degrees downtown. Not quite that warm at DIA yet. But I'm wondering where is everybody at Elitch's and at Waterworld? I didn't see anybody in the water. A lot of people, uh, instead of going into the cool water, will come inside and watch 4 o'clock at 9 noon. As they should. And then I at mean, the end of the show. I was thinking they, maybe they were napping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that too. I mean, that's, that's what I would be doing. But... <laughs> 
<laughs> no, good for you, Tom. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that Hi, that, everybody. that's the right thing to do. So thanks for <laughs> coming into the air conditioning and watching us today. Um, we have another hot summer day. We're watching some of the clouds building off to the west and east because yesterday, a little thunder, a little lightning, a brief shower for some areas, and that's something we could see again today. Not doing a lot to cut the temperatures, though. 95 currently at DIA, 105 in Pueblo, 101 in Lamar, 102 in Grand Junction, 100 in Ray, 99 in Sterling. And heat advisory, something we're talking about. Again, Colorado getting in on the action for excessive heat. Advisories for Colorado Springs Pueblo down to Walsenburg with temperatures in the triple digits. And the humidity value starting to drop as well. So fire danger will be uh, sort of a topic for us over the next few weeks. Winds remain light out of the north and northwest. And that's helping to drive these thunderstorms off the foothills and out onto the eastern plains. The base of these clouds, the underside of these clouds is so far from the ground that when they try to drop rain, it's coming out as lightning and wind. Threat for severe weather is low, and if you see a brief shower today, count yourself lucky. There is that opportunity around Castle Rock, Kiowa, Lyman in the next hour, outside of Boulder, Silver Plume, and up toward the Kremlin area, and even here in the downtown area like we saw last night very close to sunset. You may see a brief shower. These storms are moving. They're not hanging around very long, and Storm Prediction Center does not have us in the outlook area for hail-producing storms or severe storms today, which is always good news. Future cast showing a stray storm early and then clearing. We do this all over again tomorrow. So we're close to 100 in many areas now. We'll drop about 10 degrees by 8 o'clock, another 10 degrees after about 10 o'clock tonight. Tracking those isolated gusty storms on radar, we'll give you another peek at that. And then when we see cooler weather and a good chance for rain, we'll have that with the extended forecast that's coming up. Thanks, Kathy. When setting a goal that has never been achieved, it's probably good to set low expectations. Denver Mayor Mike Johnston wants to end homelessness in the city in four years, a goal that no major city has reached. Yet he plans to get 70% of that way there by the end of this year. Nine News reporter Marshall Zellinger got an update from Johnston today on his fast tracked effort to get the unhoused into housing. It is July. That means he's got, what, five months to make this happen. Yeah, and today's update was that the Emergency Operations Center opened yesterday, so that doesn't quite get us there in five months right away. Uh, also, that the city has applied for grants from the state uh, and also from the millions that will be available under Proposition 123, which voters approved on last year's November ballot, which dedicates a portion of the state's income tax specifically for affordable housing. Johnston admitted that encampments cannot be moved or swept until there are housing units available to move people into. He explained to uh, four different types of housing he wants to offer and find, to the, find for these uh, people who are unhoused. Empty rental units, hotels that can be converted into shelters, micro communities like his tiny homes idea, and large commercial buildings that can be converted into housing options. But he also admitted that the city cannot go to the encampments to close them until the city has housing to offer. We announced last week at this time our plan to bring a thousand Denverites indoors, get them access to housing and shelter, and to also work on decommissioning those encampments where people are currently living, and then to keep those uh, neighborhoods uh, free from future encampments. You know, the reason why the previous uh, challenges have not been solved is because we cannot move people off of one block if they have no place to go, they end up just on the next block. When the city has housing options, what happens to those on the street who are not interested? Johnston told me that he will not have the city arrest someone simply for being homeless, but if there is a crime being committed, someone can be arrested for that crime. Also, that encampments will be decommissioned, or I think that's just a fancy word for swept, for public health and safety reasons, or infringing on the city's right of way or someone's private property, which does not quite sound any different than the previous administration. And that's what we're going to say. What separates us from what Mayor Hancock said? I mean, many people have identified this as a huge problem. So uh, I, I think the one thing right now is that he says the difference is that when you go through a, an encampment, you cannot do that until you have a housing option, that it's not just we're going to fence this off and now you just can't live here anymore. It's we're going to close this or perhaps fence it off. But here are the places we have set aside now. Which one do you want to go to? but I'm also not gonna arrest you if you choose not to. Okay, you are gonna be following this. So it's mm -hmm. July on your mark, Marshall. Let's see what happens by December, <laughs> okay. No kidding, yeah. yeah.
Homelessness really isn't just a Denver issue. All of Denver suburbs suffered some kind of an increase in their homeless population this year. The Jefferson County is a good example for this. During this year's annual point in time count in January, we talked about yesterday, volunteers counted 854 people living in shelters and on the streets in Jeffco, and that's up 350 people from the year prior. The number of people living on the streets in Jeffco increased by 152%. The data will help providers in Jefferson County apply for funding to help more people out. And one provider says that increase in people without shelter points to another huge need in the county. Um, our unsheltered number rose drastically. That also makes a lot of sense here in Jefferson County. We don't have a shelter for people experiencing homelessness in Jefferson County, so there's not a space for folks to go. Casey Ratliff with Family Tree says she is noticing a shift in public perception of homelessness as people on the streets become more visible to folks in the suburbs. And she says she's seen a lot less of that not in my backyard mentality when it comes to providing resources, which could help Jeffco progress towards helping more people. We'll have much more on those numbers in Denver suburbs coming up at five o'clock. UPS and the Teamsters Union have now reached a tentative deal to avoid a labor strike. The Teamsters Union represents some 330,000 UPS employees here in the U.S. So what they've reached is a five-year deal. The Teamsters GM says the new deal will raise rate wages for all workers, create more full-time jobs, and provide more workplace protections and improvements. Simple things like air conditioning and cargo ventilation in delivery vehicles. Shocked. Shocked, but excited. You know, just for the simple fact that, you know, talking about strike, tensions are high, emotions are high. This is good. This is a start. I mean, I mean, the language is there, but if, if everything they said is true, we're happy about it. The tentative agreement has been reached. Now reps from UPS and the Teamster locals will meet on Monday to review and then recommend the deal. Then the member voting will start on August 3rd. In about a month, federal student loans are going to start to gain interest. So a few weeks after that, millions of borrowers will once again have to make a student loan payment for the first time in three years. Nine News reporter Jaleesa Irizarry explains why some Coloradans won't have to make that payment and what one college is doing to help their students. Metropolitan State University of Denver may be quiet, but signs around the financial aid office show what's ahead. So those same steps that I share with my students are the same steps that I also use today. Kerline Egloss is the director of financial aid. She's also a student loan borrower. She wants to make sure that with all the back and forth, students know how this all impacts them. So about 30% of our students are on financial aid, whether the loans were forgiven or not. The most important process was preparing our students for budgeting. If you're not engaged into this process, you will be surprised. And we don't want our students or any of the campus community to be surprised. Surprise is what likely thousands of former College America students were today when they found out their loans were forgiven. This is truly a new day for these student borrowers. Attorney General Phil Weiser, alongside the U.S. Department of Education, announced $130 million worth of student loans will be wiped away between 7,400 students that attended College America Colorado campuses. These colleges have since closed down, but according to Weiser, the College America's parent company misrepresented the salary and employment rates for its graduates. By giving them debt relief right now, we're giving them a new opportunity. Back at MSU Denver, the financial aid office is all about opportunity. Exactly, exactly. Egloss wants to make sure students know more about their loans than she ever did. So we are really trying to inform our students to make budget-friendly decisions, um, even for their personal lives as well. Democratic Attorney General Weiser says those borrowers that attended College America schools in Colorado will be notified about the forgiveness next month. Now, to be clear, MSU Denver is not affiliated with College America. MSU Denver says they're trying a number of things to have their students better understand the repayment process. That includes hosting a few podcasts. There's a lot of money in limbo here. Depending on how this eventually falls one way or the other, there will be another swing, another try at getting this done. But there's a lot of money that is hanging over people's heads and in the entirety of the economy.
It, it really is. It's a stressful thing. And I think something that a lot of 18 year olds that sign on that dotted line don't realize is that my money follows you for a very long time. Take it from a 33 year old still paying student loans. <laughs> but it's one of those things that you really need to be educated about. If I could go back in time, I would learn a little bit more about my student loans and the interest rates and all that jazz. Um, but it's one of those things that MSC Denver is trying to kind of right the wrongs in a sense of making sure that these students know what they're doing when they invest into their education. Maybe that's a good great. college course. Wild, oh, you're, right? You're already in college. I know, so that's the good, problem. Like you had it. to put the money down the loan to get that class. That could be a great freshman 101 course, I say. It is a good freshman 101. Make your decisions wisely as you move along. Exactly. Okay, Jaleesa, you're going to make it. We believe in you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Just to have it.